Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, UMass Professor Dr. Amilcar Shabazz and Take the Mic and Kwanzaa Coordinators Ayana Crawford helping us to demystify Kwanzaa before the many celebrations and festivities all over the four counties begin. Next week. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hear a happy cow story and one of resilience and adaptation as we chat with Denise Barstow Mans of Barstow's in Hadley, one of the oldest continuously operating farms in the area. Right now, however, since we bumped him yesterday, a tale of science deferred. How do you feel that you had to get bumped by Jeff Tweedy? <laughs> well, not by Jeff Tweedy. <laughs> You're a big no, Wilco fan. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a huge Wilco fan, so I'm, I'm honored to be bumped. I wish I was bumped a little bit more by Wilco. <laughs> To boldly go where no man has gone before. Time for our last kitchen table astronomy of 2023 with Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe. But time is a human construct and makes no difference to the universe in general, really. <laughs> so it doesn't matter that this is the last one of the year. However, we're going to do all the last one of the year type stuff where we, uh, we look back. You want to talk about astronomy, a book, and a movie. Uh, that is correct. So let's start with astronomy. They were couple of interesting missions. Uh, one was the OSIRIS-REx mission that brought samples back from an asteroid. Uh, this is the first time a NASA mission brought it back uh, to Earth. Uh, so that was actually amazing technological feat. We actually get meteoroids, for example, that fall from the sky. Well, I mean, you know, from, from the universe. Yeah. <laughs> but, they, but as they go through our atmosphere, they get modified, they get transformed. But this because is... they burn up. Because they burn up. And this is where this particular mission comes in where the, you, you are getting a pristine sample. And of course, uh, these asteroids hold clues from the, about the formation of our solar system, probably sort of like, you know, about organic compounds from which life arose and so on and so forth. So it's actually really interesting. The other one, of course, from the South Asia connection was the big successful landing of uh, the Chandrayaan-3 from Indian um, spacecraft near the South Pole of the moon. That was an amazing development. And of course, James Webb Space Telescope keeps on giving us great stuff. I think the thing to highlight would be a lot of exoplanet atmospheres. Exoplanets are the planets that are orbiting other stars. One of the big missions of James Webb Space Telescope is to potentially look for signatures of life. It has detected various molecules in the atmospheres of exoplanets. I mean, this is hard because like 30 years ago, we did not know you even the existence of exoplanets. We theorized that they must exist, but we couldn't observe them and prove here is an exoplanet until the 90s. Because it's very hard. You, are, you have a small planet right next to a really bright star. Uh, and so it is difficult so, to come in 30 years to the point where we can actually start detecting what is in the atmospheres of these exoplanets. That is already a huge advancement. So that is exciting. However, what I thought I'm gonna highlight for astronomy news is something that is a problem. And that is how we sensationalize astronomy news. I think mid-year, Monty, we talked about this big news, like, you know, that James Webb Space Telescope has found galaxies early in the universe that should not exist. Uh -huh. And in fact, the headline was like, you know, these are impossible galaxies. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> authors themselves said, we broke the universe. And that <laughs> led to various kinds of headlines that, you know, that James Webb Space Telescope disproves Big Bang. This is, it just breaks sort of all of cosmology, so on and so forth. And we talked about it at that time as well, that there is a problem with these kind of headlines, because when you have a new instrument, when you have these kind of results, it's not that, oh my goodness, look, this is, these are impossible. Rather, hey, this is really interesting. Let's figure out why this might be the case. Mm -hmm. When James Webb Space Telescope is specifically designed, one of its big goals is to look for the earliest galaxies, maybe even the first stars, but certainly the earliest galaxies. So the results came out that it is detecting galaxies a few hundred, couple of hundred million years after the Big Bang. So and the theory was that they shouldn't be able to have formed that early. That big, right? I mean, you would expect that the first galaxies would be much smaller in size, and then it takes some time for galaxies to have more stars, develop, develop more stars, and to become bigger. So that was the big news story that, well, it is detecting really massive galaxies. Like, there are a lot of stars in those galaxies. And only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. So that was really surprising. A lot of people were saying, like, you know, yeah, these are unusual. This is a fantastic discovery. But it doesn't mean 
that the Big Bang model is wrong, or it doesn't mean that these galaxies are impossible. Before we get to those points, we may just be the earliest stars, maybe a little bit different the way they are producing light. And now it's coming out that indeed, and again, this is a technical term, but I'll use it because it's fun. It's called IMF. And it's not the International Monetary Fund, <laughs> which is also a cause of a lot of problems in the world. But this is the initial mass function. Meaning to say, you see light, and then you assume that what is the distribution of stars? How many big stars and how many small stars are producing that light? And we assume, because it's much more accurate to measure nearby galaxies than far, far away. So the models that were used for the farthest galaxies, the earliest galaxies in the universe, we were using the models for the nearby universe. And some people had suggested that, well, early in the universe, that may be different. So because don't jump to conclusions and say the universe is broken or that the Big Bang is not true. That's really on us, the media, for sensationalizing this. And that's the point that I want to make. We are getting to the point where everything is about grabbing attention. So we talk about attention economy and like, you know, so you have a TikTok or you have whatever, like, you know, but that is a problem because scientists themselves, like in that particular case, the scientists themselves made those headlines. You and I have been contacted uh, sometimes about news stories from universities. They say, hey, this is a really big story coming out and the scientist is available to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But actually, you look at it like, no, I mean, it's an interesting story, but it's not the biggest story. So there is this element of, I would almost say, the corporatization of science and science stories because there is a system now on how to get to the news. Those galaxies didn't break the universe. So the Big Bang was not disproven by these galaxies. So I want to highlight at the end of the year, no, no. <laughs> this was the biggest story, but actually people thought it was the biggest story, but it's not. And there is a problem with that. And the same problem goes with claims about UFOs as well. Avi Loeb claimed like, you know, that Harvard, Harvard astronomer, astronomer. Yeah. like, you know, that from under the ocean, he found some alien technology spherules. It turns out those were industrial pollutants, but he's really good at getting publicity. And he has explicitly said publicity is good because it gets money. That is a problem. We don't need to sensationalize but because of the nature of news cycles, this is becoming, and, and I am really concerned about it, that as time is going on, we are going to see more and more of these sensational stories, and people will have a harder time to, to assess which is a real story and which is just sensational. And you go like, ah, scientists don't know. A big bang. Who knows? One day they say this, one day they say the other. Same thing like with evolution that has happened. Sort of like, oh, evolution, who knows? Like, you know, people don't know. So I think as scientists, we have to be careful about how we assess things. Well, that ties into Merriam-Webster, our dictionary in Springfield, and our other regular guest's word of the year, which is authentic. People looked up authentic this year over last year much more because they're looking for what's true. One of the runners up for word of the year was Doppelganger, and that brings us to the book portion of your year in review here, the Naomi Klein book, Doppelganger, which is one of the reasons why that word spiked in lookups for Merriam-Webster. I absolutely loved this book. And actually, this is not disconnected from the just a conversation we were having. So Doppelganger, uh, that's a book by Naomi Klein, and she wrote about because she was often mistaken for another Naomi, Naomi Wolf who used to be a liberal, but then she became conservative and vaccine denier and so on and so forth. This is a fantastic book. It's a deeper analysis of our culture today. I mean, it explains conspiracy theories, for example, like, you know, that there are people who used to be, that, that's where Naomi Wolf also comes in, who would be critical, who would be on the left, but then they flipped. The question is why? And that's where the doppelganger part comes in, that they are similar, but a bit different. Mm -hmm. So Naomi Klein actually goes a bit deeper into that and she thinks that in some ways our whole society has also, within the American context, and I think it applies to a certain degree globally as well, but she's talking about the American context, they have become a doppelganger of itself. Mm -hmm. And there are similar elements, but not the same. And that goes with, uh, of course, COVID did not help a lot of it. Her, her, her book is focused on COVID. But what I really appreciated was the connection what I was, when I was reading it, to a lot of the UFO stuff as well. And we were just talking about the attention economy. Mm -hmm. And this disaster capitalism comes in, or she calls it sort of like capitalizable conspiracies, meaning to say that you have this anti-vaccine stuff. 
But by using anti-vaccine stuff, you can be on TikTok, you can be on YouTube, you can, you can have run your for president. Own, or you can run for president. So what her point is that there is this attention grabbing aspect and these conspiracies have become capitalizable. Mm -hmm. And that connects to the UFO stuff that I was talking about, because indeed the whole UAP stuff which you get sort of like, you know, congressional hearings about it. Of course, nothing has happened. Even last Sunday, Ross Douthout, who's, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his I name. I never right. know how to say that guy's name. <laughs> Do that? I don't know. But uh, He's the he, more conservative he, voice in the opinion pages of the Sunday Times. And he has, I mean, he's a thoughtful guy. I mean, like, I think so those, too. Uh, I mean, I would disagree with him 80% of the time, but I think you can have a good, interesting conversation Absolutely. with him. Unlike uh, Brett Stevens, I think. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> his thing was like, you know, either put up or shut up. And he was talking about the UFO claims about it because now it shows up in the Senate hearings. Right. It's shown up in the congressional hearings. The and Senate's mad at the House for not revealing, allowing this information to be revealed. But. And so I'm deeply skeptical about it because if that was the case, the world would be very different than it is now. But this is where Doppelganger, the book, talks about that our culture right now because it's so embedded in the attention aspects that these conspiracies themselves actually they make a lot of money she talks about that sometimes i mean there is an element of truth what for example anti covid people were saying i mean of course vaccines work but there was an element about skepticism for example to the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. and what she was saying an interesting point i think is about the fact that when the left, you know, or people who believed in sort of like, you know, the vaccines work and things like that. When they went like, no, vaccines work, they also became less critical of the problems of pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. And that's the problem. Whereas the people who were denying that vaccines work or vaccines are a conspiracy and things like that, they were actually critical of pharmaceutical companies, which everyone ought to be. I know. It's like weird when the vaccine's out there and everything on TV is sponsored by Pfizer all of a sudden. I was like, this doesn't feel good. Not to mention <laughs> that uh, that these companies, which were heavily subsidized by the government here and other governments as well, and those vaccines were not made easily available for mm -hmm. the developing world. Right. And they made a ton of profit. So what she talks about is are these things where she says that conspiracy theorists get the facts wrong, but they often get the feeling right. Mm. And that is the appeal of these conspiracy theories or why people would be there because they go like, I get it. There is something that is to it. And oftentimes we abandon that whole ground of criticism, which we should not. Check it out. Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. And you also have one movie to wrap up our year in the world of kitchen table astronomy, which we've talked a lot about books and movies. We've gone to the movies this past year. You're on the board of Amherst Cinema. Mr. Universe there, Dr. Salman Hamid. What's the movie you want to talk about? I would have picked, in theory, from the science perspective, Oppenheimer, but I did not. I want to highlight a movie called Past Lives. It's a small indie film. It's getting a lot of buzz for the award season, which I'm so happy about. It's written and directed by Celine Song, and it stars Greta Lee in it. And it's a Korean-American film set mostly in the U.S., in New York City. And the, what I liked about this film, this film is about this girl... Uh, who was in Seoul in Korea. And when she was 12 years old, her parents immigrated to the U.S. And she had a best friend at that time over there. And then many, many, many years later, she reconnects with her friend. I'm an immigrant. I came uh, to the U.S. when I was 18. Uh, I've been here since then. And to me, this movie gets to this heart of the immigrant experience. I mean, oftentimes... Uh, these immigrant experiences are, oh my goodness, it's terrible, or it's, there's a culture clash and things like that. This movie actually is more subtle in there. As somebody moving from completely one culture to a completely different culture, there is almost a break that happens. Like, you know, you literally, you leave your whole persona, your whole life, your whole culture in a different place. What happens to your past life? You have that as well. Right. And so what is your new life? Because you bring all of the other cultural context to this new setting and you become a very different new person. How do you think about this loss and gain? And I think this movie grapples with that. It's a love story to New York City as well. But to me, the best part of that is it's just this subtle way of really grappling with 
the things that you lose and the things that you gain by moving from one context to another and the value of both. So it's a really beautiful immigrant experience story and how we make sense of life. And it's about life. And what a perfect movie to transition from one year that you leave behind to a new year that's filled with hopes and dreams and a chance to restart. I think 2024 to get sensationalist about it. The year we're going to prove that aliens exist. Well, uh, <laughs> it, it depends upon the election. <laughs> touche, touche, professor. <laughs> On the way, getting into the introspection and community building nature of Kwanzaa with Professor Amalkar Shabazz and Take the Mic director Ayana Crawford. But first, to the flood banks of Hockenham and Hadley to hear all about the girls of Barstow's with marketing director Denise Barstow Mans. Girls in this case means cows. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 885 NEPM. It's our last local hero spotlight of the year. And what a year it's been <laughs> for farming. We're with Phil Corman from CESA, the local hero folks, and Denise Barstow Mans from the legendary Barstow Farm and Dairy in South Hadley. Hadley, Hadley officially, Hadley but pretty yeah. close though. You're Very getting, close. Yeah. Really? Not that far from the flood marker. Yeah. <laughs> the old flood marker where you're driving down there and you see where the floods of what year was that? Do you know? Uh, 1936 and 1938. <laughs> We've had a lot of sad dairy cow stories over the course of this last year, but Barstow is uh, a, still a successful dairy farm story. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> we're still here. We've been here for 217 years, so we'll keep it going another 200, I hope. Tell us a little bit about the history of the farm. Yeah, so Barstow's Longview Farm was founded by my ancestors in 1806, and our motto is looking forward since 1806, so that's our commitment every day to our herd, our land, our workforce, our community, and our food system. We have 600 head. We milk 300 dairy cows. We're part of the Cabot Agrimark Cooperative. Cabot has 500 farm families in New England and New York, and we are very lucky to be one of them. Yeah, so when you see the Cabot cheese in your pretty much every supermarket, know that that's a cooperative. Sometimes it's cheaper to get the big block of cheddar, and sometimes <laughs> it's cheaper to get multiple little blocks of cheddar. Mm. Currently, my last grocery shopping experience, cheaper to get multiple little blocks. That has nothing to do with you, Denise Barso, man, <laughs> except for the <laughs> fact that it's that. some of your cow's milk that goes into that Cabot cheese. I just appreciate that now they make a mac and cheese blend so I don't have to decide on my own, because ah. sometimes I don't want to think about it. Nice. <laughs> Despite being a 200 plus year old farm, you are innovators in farming technology. You know, I give a lot of farm tours and I think people are really surprised by the amount of technology that we have on the farm. Um, but technology makes it fundamentally better for our cows, our soil, and for our bodies. Um, and I think when we talk about sustainability, having the next generation able to go out and work and not, you know, be home with a backache is really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you ever like physically milked a cow old school? You know, no, because when I was Born, we had a milking parlor. Um, in 2014, we did uh, bring in robotic milkers. So now our cows milk themselves. Um, they all have a collar on them so it knows who they are, like an easy pass when they go into the robot. Um, <laughs> it remembers the last time that she milked, how much milk she's going to give. Um, and it just makes it so they can all be on their own schedules, um, which means that our animals are more comfortable more of the time. And every dairy farmer in the whole world knows that a comfortable dairy cow is going to give more milk and higher quality milk and probably not show up on the vet bill. Um, so <laughs> very important to our bottom line and um, to our animal care to have these robots. Because the robots also track how healthy the cow is too, right? Yeah, there's a lot of components to it. So, you know, it takes their weight, takes their temperature, um, and then it also is giving them grain based on their last lactation. So it's very um, focused for each animal, individualized care. Um, and if there is something going on that we should know about, it'll send us a text message like check in on Henrietta or whoever. How do the cows text with their hooves? I can't even like do it with my regular <laughs> human thumbs. No. We're talking with Denise Barstow Mans from Barstow Farm in Hadley, a big, I don't wanna call it ancient, but it's certainly old operation here in the Valley over 200 years. So I think there's two aspects that come to my mind when I think about the farm. One is that like many businesses that have been trying to be going for over 200 years, Barstow's has had to adapt to continue to be financially sustainable. And then the other part is how much agricultural land it's steward. I'd love to hear you talk about those two things. You know, in, in the early 2000s, the milk market really crashed 
on everyone. Um, so we sat down as a family and talked about what we wanted to do to diversify and bring in more revenue streams so that we could continue farming. Um, and so one of those things was um, opening up Barstow's Dairy Store and Bakery. We opened that up in 2008. Um, and, you know, we kind of opened it to be the front door of our, our farm, um, Save the Farm. And it's really become this like time capsule for family recipes and this important gathering place for our community where we can have this ongoing conversation about food. Right now, my cousins are up to their eyeballs in bakery orders for Christmas, for the holidays. <laughs> um, and we will still have, you know, extras. So if you forgot to put your order in, um, we've got pies, we've got cookies, we've got cheesecakes ready to go. You know, it's so great that you're selling local milk that's not your own. Can you just talk a little bit about why some dairies uh, need to process their own milk and other dairies like yours are very clear that selling wholesale is a much better model for your family? Yeah. Um, on our farm, we don't do our own processing. We sell it all wholesale to the Cabot Creamery Cooperative. And that really works for us because we can just focus on farming, taking care of our girls, um, and they can focus on moving it around, doing all the marketing, all the processing, bottling. Um, so that's what works for us. And if there was someone in the next generation that really wanted to do their own bottling, then maybe that would be something that we would consider. Um, but every Dairy farm is like its own little science project, right? We're all making milk, but we're all doing it a little bit differently. And I think that that makes a really resilient food system is to have that diversity in all these different farms. How many generations are currently working at Barstow's? Uh, we're a sixth and seventh generation owned and operated farm. And the eighth generation is running around getting into trouble. <laughs> are there members of like five and four still kicking around doing some stuff on the farm? Um, there was when I was a kid. Yeah, my grandfather was on the farm and my great uncle John. But I think that the crazy thing about farming is it's so entrenched in legacy. Like we are talking about Septimus who came here in 1806. What a name, right? Um, who founded I wonder the farm. what number of child he was. <laughs> Actually, weirdly not related to that. He wasn't even born in September. Wait, is he the ninth child, though? What, um, yeah, or what seventh. Is a, what is a Septimist? Septimus is his name, but like he was, he's not the seventh child. He's not born in September. I thought that was like their religion. No, no we were, yeah. we no, were no, Septimus, so we had to leave England and come over. Optimist. Uh, no, yeah, no, no, no. He, he's Septimus. I'm like, okay, so he's the seventh kid. Good going. That's where I would have gone to. Right. Yeah. I have a deviated Septimist. No. I can barely breathe at this point. No. But, you know, still going, looking backwards 200 years at Barstow's and looking forward in the future, you have these huge digesters on the farm there. Can you tell us about what those are and do? Yeah, we have an anaerobic digester. It's a system that takes the energy potential out of cow manure and food waste, and it turns it into enough electricity to power 1,600 homes. So we're getting food waste from local food producers like Cabot, um, Coca-Cola. We get stuff from Whole Foods. We get grease trap waste from local restaurants. And we also have plenty of manure from our cows. And that all commingles in a digester, which works a lot like a stomach. So it's really warm in this big tank um, and everything's moving around. And there's microbes that break down that food waste, that cow manure, and make methane gas. So we're capturing all of that and running it through these engines, which turns a generator and makes electricity that goes off to the grid. And we're only using about 4% of what we produce on the farm. So the vast majority of it is going right out into Hadley, South Hadley, and Amherst. That's amazing. How did that idea come about? Because I don't know if any other farms are doing anything to that scale with this sort of anaerobic um, digesters to create electricity. There, I think there's seven farms maybe in, in the state that are, are have methane digesters. Some of them kind of learn from each other and work together to bring in an outside because you can't run this yourself. Right. Oh, so that's, yeah. somebody else kind of runs that whole thing? Yes. Yeah. So again, like so we can focus on farming. We do work with Vanguard Renewable Energy and they do all the operations and day-to-day -day of the digester. So that's all the maintenance, all the food waste contracts, the chemistry. There's a lot that goes into it, and we want to make sure that we're always capturing that methane, not letting it go, um, making that electricity that, that's going out to the grid as green renewable energy. So I made the mistake of asking you two questions at the same time. The second half was around, you have 600 head, 300 being milked. How much acreage do you need to raise and, and produce the milk from those cows? So we're making it work with 450 acres. Um, we could would love more um, to have more diversity in our feed and also just to take some of the pressure off of if the 160 acres happen to be underwater like it was on July 10th, that we can be a little more resilient in the face of those uh, climate crises. So 450 acres, actually most of it we don't own, a lot of it we lease. And we do 
uh, everything that we can for soil and and making sure that we have healthy soils on that land. So soil is, you know, as important as our animal health because our, the soil is sustaining our family and our cows um, and our community. It's a natural resource that's so important that that soil is well, well cared for. So farmers are stewards of the land um, and we take that job very seriously on the farm. We use cover crops to keep all of that soil in the ground all winter um, when it's really wet and raining and, and windy. Um, we have a riparian buffer along our streams and, and the Connecticut River, um, which is great for a flooding buffer um, and minimizing erosion. Um, it's also a really important wildlife corridor to have that. Um, we also use 100% no-till farming practices on the farm. Tillage is the act of turning the soil every year in the spring. It makes it very nice and easy to plant in. but we know that you're disrupting the soil when you do that tillage process. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff that is alive in the soil. And we know that things that are alive have carbon in them. So if we can keep more things alive in the soil, we're going to sequester more carbon in the ground. We use a no-till planter, and it brings along a blade. It drops the seed at the measured level and covers that seed behind it. Um, so that's a very low touch way of farming. We're speaking with Denise Barstow-Mans from Barstow's Farm in Hadley. We have mentioned a little bit about the floods. Looking back on 2023, it's probably the top, certainly the top agricultural story, the, the climatological devastation. You mentioned over 100 acres of yours were underwater. What else happened during those floods and how have the uh, programs that were created in the aftermath helped Barstow's? Having the Connecticut River come up was you know, surprising in a lot of ways because there wasn't much we could do besides just watch watch it come. Um, so we had about 160 acres underwater. Most of it was corn. We lost 40 acres outright, so we just cut it down and disposed of it. And then we probably lost an additional 40 acres just to having it be way low quality. So there was rot in there, mycotoxins. It's a it's a plant disease, um, so that's going to stick around in the sto in the soil for um, crop yields to come, unfortunately. Um, and then we because of the rain that followed it, um, we lost our entire second cutting of hay and almost all of our third cutting of hay. And we usually get four or five per year. So it's a, it was a big loss. Um, and also, we weren't alone. Um, so hay prices are very expensive. Um, we had a lot of folks to compete with for pricing. It was a big, big blow to the farm. It was a tough year for us. So what about the, the Massachusetts Farm Resiliency Fund? What about the money from the legislature? How much of that has helped you? It has helped, right? So uh, we have no idea how many farms would have had to shut their doors if that kind of opportunity wasn't available. Um, the disaster relief funding, there was the Farm Resiliency Fund, which was made up mostly from philanthropists, which is amazing. We have such a supportive community here in Massachusetts. Um, and then, you know, CESA has their emergency fund, which is a zero interest loan. Um, so all of that pooled together is going to make it so that a lot of our local farms can last, which is just so essential to food security. When we talked with Ashley Randall the Ma from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, she said she didn't know of any farms that were not going to continue from this year to next. So that's really good news. And part of the insanity of farmers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which we kind of rely on in a way for our food to what get do you mean, to our. Kind of. <laughs> and it's just so important, I think, that while everyone gave was being so generous, we need to understand that it did not even cover half of the losses that farms experienced. And it means they're entering next year in a tough position with, again, unknown weather going to be happening. So. There's been one farmer who has suggested that we support uh, firefighters and police officers. They're just essential municipal roles. And maybe we need to start thinking about how we support farmers because it seems like that's kind of an essential role, too. Mm. Would you say that it's harder because people don't necessarily understand some of the extra steps that especially raising livestock takes? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of challenges that, that livestock farmers get to face because we have living, breathing animals that need our attention every day, you know, not just during the growing season. It's every single day. You know, with climate change, heat stress is a really big thing that we're um, concerned about. And, um, you know, ahead of those floods, we were looking at some of the hottest days on record. Um, and it was really tough on our farm workers. It's not safe for them. And it's also really tough on the cows. They're 1,500 pound animals. Um, it's really hard for them to bring their temperature down if they get too hot. Um, so we put a lot of 
uh, infrastructure into place to make sure that they're staying comfortable. We've got sprinklers, we've got fans, we have a curtain system that automatically goes up or down to bring in the wind. There's only so much we can do. Um, we try to keep everything about our cows routine consistent, you know, the care, uh, the milking program, the food quality, and also the temperature. But that one is certainly the hardest one to keep the same all the time. So as we were driving in for this interview, uh, you were mentioning, Denise, and we were talking about holidays, and you mentioned that it's really good that your dad can work on Christmas Day so no one else has to. My Thanks, Dad! Yeah. <laughs> My immediate family, we, we do our Christmas on the 27th. And yes, the, a lot of the farmhands are still there. It's not just my dad all alone on Christmas Day. But it is kind of nice that um, on Christmas morning, um, my dad is available. Why does your dad have to do it? He doesn't have to. Are you just asking for dads? Yeah, just dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dads united. They volunteer. Dude, like, dude. like, he hates Christmas. <laughs> like, he doesn't celebrate Christmas. Or... So my day-to-day is actually at Barstow's Dairy Store and Bakery. So um, that's closed on, on Christmas. <laughs> Denise Barstow Mans from Barstow's Dairy and Bakery and, and anaerobic digester and 600 head of cattle dairy farm. Uh, hopefully 2024 fares better for you and all of the farmers in the area. Uh, but if not organizations like CISA, the local hero folks, and the community writ large here in the, the fabulous 413 are around to try to, to have your back as best we can. You can find out about all of our local heroes at buylocalfood.org. Shout out to my ex-roommate just there. He used to work with you. <laughs> According to Denise Barstow Mans, this year has brought us remarkably close to meeting and perhaps surpassing the amount of flooding that led to that marker we talked about. And if you're in Hadley and know the specifics of those numbers, drop us a line at the fab413 at nepm.org. We are curious and alarmed. Up next, seven days, seven principles, and a lot more ways to connect with the self and the community as we learn about Kwanzaa. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Clee Smith. And we're betting that you might not know as much as you could about Kwanzaa. And honestly, there's a lot to the holiday and its history. To help us have a better understanding of the celebration and what it entails, our UMass professor, Dr. Amalkar Shabazz, an educator and public speaking coach and director of Take the Mic, Ayana Crawford. Dr. Amalkar Shabazz is a professor in the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies at UMass since... Tw- 20, uh, 2007. You can't say 2007. That's weird. 20 aught seven. Oh, no. <laughs> he served as the department's seventh chair twice, and since 2016, he has acted as the department's chair in an interim term. He continues to teach in the department with an emphasis on the political economy of social and cultural movements, education, and public pos- policy. Dr. Shabazz has been a Fulbright senior specialist and has done work in Brazil, Ghana, Japan, Cuba, and other countries. And in 2014, and again in 2016, 16, Shabazz was elected as vice president of the National Council for Black Studies, the premier organization of black studies professionals in the world. Presently, he's completing a historical biography of lawyer, journalist, entrepreneur Carter Wesley, among other projects. Ayanna Crawford is the Kwanzaa Collective president, a businesswoman, a motivational speaker, public speaking and media coach, former chief of staff for state representative Orlando Ramos. She's founder of Take the Mic, an organization that teaches young BIPOC women public speaking techniques. She's been on the show before to talk about that. Mm -hmm. She's the Springfield wide Kwanzaa coordinator for this year, 2023, working on this year's calendar of Kwanzaa proclamations throughout the region and beyond with Dr. Shabazz and both of you. Seemed delighted to hear the Teddy Pendergrass song <laughs> that I let off with there, the Kwanzaa celebration Who's song. Who's not happy to hear Teddy Pendergrass? I know, right? Yes, <laughs> no, this is exciting. So thank you so much for having us on today. I'm so excited. And so Teddy Pendergrass song was our uh, prelude, if you will, to our virtual Kwanzaa's that we had during the pandemic. Ah, so, and uh, so it was so connecting to us, and I'm sure the community remembers when we did the virtual that we would always have... Teddy Pendergrass's song with us. So it's, it was so re- reminiscent. Perfect. <laughs> and serendipitous that that was the one yes. we picked to lead off with there. <laughs> so Kwanzaa, uh, people hear about it. They hear the name. They hear, well, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa. And as Khalees and we have alluded to, maybe people don't know as much about Kwanzaa. And that may be because it's a more, a much more recent holiday compared to Hanukkah and Christmas, for sure. Um, Dr. Shabazz, tell us a little bit about the origins of Kwanzaa. 
So good to be with you all. Um, Kwanzaa was part of a cultural revolution in the 1960s, coming out of uh, the background of slavery and of Jim Crow, separate but unequal society. Uh, black people were uh, an omnipresent part of American society, but really not known, not understood, uh, and even to themselves, any sense of their their own ancestry and background beyond where you hit that 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 no man's land of slavery and you can't find any records and you don't know where you know anything past maybe grandma and grandpa and and so it was a time in which Dr. Milana Karinga saw the need for a kind of philosophy and, 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 and principles that could begin to connect us to our African uh, heritage, our African ancestry in a positive way. And that becomes the basis of, of Kwanzaa and what he called Kawaida philosophy. Uh, why Swahili for the principles of Kwanzaa? It's interesting because uh, Dr. Karinga taught, has taught himself multiple African languages. He could have gone in a number mm -hmm. of directions, mm -hmm. um, uh, Hausa, uh, uh, ancient Egyptian uh, Kemet, Kemetic languages. <laughs> but uh, Kiswahili was very popular. Um, it is a language widely spoken across the African continent. And when Pan-Africanists would get together and they talk about what might be a kind of a f lingua franca uh, uh, for, for the entire co continent in the 60s, uh, Kiswahili came out, came out number one. It's also rather, rather easy to pick up, rather easy to learn. So um, that became the basis for, for all of the, the, the terms and, and principles. Uh, um, it, it was Kiswahili. Why was this holiday put at this time of year? It's a holiday. It's a time of year where there are so many holidays going on. Is there a reason that he chose to uh, try to center it around this solstice time? I think that um, predicated on the idea of the harvest festival, mm -hmm. uh, that this is the time in which we... Uh, in, in Africa, you would bring in the first fruits, you'd bring in the, of the harvest, and, and you'd celebrate the bountifulness of the har harvest. He, he wanted to go with this. He's often said it has nothing to do with trying to uh, uh, be in contrast to Hanukkah or Christmas or, or the winter solstice or anything. He was just trying to find a good time in which the families and people could come together uh, that may already be coming together in family reunions during that time that they could then go go right into the season of Kwanzaa. And worth noting that it does start on the 26th. Yes. So technically, it's you know they, it spans the uh, new year, but it's after Christmas is over and, and can really focus on these seven days and seven principles. That's right. Maybe before we take a break, let's go over the, uh, let's talk about the principles. What are the, what are the seven principles? You want to take that one? The, uh, you are the president of uh, the Kwanzaa <laughs> Collective, Ayanna Crawford. Let's talk about the seven principles. Yes, let's do that. And first, before we do that, I just want to mention some of the uh, Swahili terms. There's a particular term that we do use in Kwanzaa that we say each and every night, and it's called habarigani. Mm -hmm. Habarigani is what's the news or what is the principle of the day. And so when Dr. Shabazz mentioned that, we and our families and our community shout that word out and say, Habarigani. What is the news? What is the principle of the day? And so the principle um, that we're going to talk about right now are the seven principles of Kwanzaa. And the first one is umoja. Unity. Which means unity. To strive for and maintain unity in our community, our nation, and our race. And number two is kujichagulia or kujichakalia, which is self-determination. It's my favorite Exactly, right? It's the most fun one to say. It is the most <laughs> fun one to say. Our friend in Holyoke, that's her actual name as well, uh, uh, Kuji, uh, Teresa Gordon Cooper, who's launched uh, Kwanzaa in, uh, in Holyoke. When I had to learn about Kwanzaa many years ago in Metco, that was the day I had to learn about. So I have a personal like, <laughs> like favor, favoritism for that particular term and day, but that's, yes. that's just me. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, and then two our- Two more U's. Two more U's. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ujima. Ujima. Collective with, work and responsibility. And number four. Ujama. Ujama, which is- Cooperative economics. That's right. And number five. This is a quiz happening live. <laughs> Mia. Ayana Mia. is quizzing Mia. Dr. Shabazz and he's getting it right. What was number five? Mia's a popular name too. Yes, yes. Mia. Actually, Nia was my mother's name that she took on. 
Um, and, and let me tell you this really story before we go, go to the next principle, is I celebrated Kwanzaa as a child in my home. And so each and every um, time that we would um, do Kwanzaa, she would always make sure that we remembered that mommy took on the name of Nia, which means purpose. Mm. And so that was her name, not only during Kwanzaa, but that was her name she took. And also I want to make... Um, note of sort of a sidebar is that I have two brother, two a sister and a brother. One is named Imani, which is also a principal of Kwanzaa, and my brother, who I don't know if Dr. Shabazz knows this, but he is Kuji Chagulia or oh. Kuji Chakalia. Oh. Ah. And so, can you imagine a kindergartner? <laughs> 40 years ago, my brother's 40, <laughs> trying to spell that yeah. in kindergarten. And yeah. my mother was very clear that you are to teach him how to spell his name, <laughs> Kuji Chagulia. <laughs> and so we grew up with that. So, yes, interesting, right? So mm-hmm. I have a real deep seated root um, with Kwanzaa. And so after Nia is the one we're going to be celebrating in Amherst, that's Kuumba, Kuumba. creativity. Exactly. And then our last and final um, celebration of, of Kwanzaa's principle is Imani, which means faith. faith. And that is very um, special to me because that's my sister's name, mm-hmm. Imani. And so those are the seven principles of Kwanzaa. And again, each and every day that we say those principles, we reflect upon the principles, we strive to embody those principles in our everyday life. It's not just during the festive time, but these are daily principles that we want to build upon. We want to help people understand what they are and what they mean. And it really um, crosses cultural nuances as well. And so these principles are really universal Mm -hmm. in, in their regard. So I wanted to share that as well. And what's great is that each of these principles has a different event happening locally here in Western Massachusetts that we will hear about in just a little bit. More on the history and the contemporary celebrations mm. of Kwanzaa with Ayana Crawford and Dr. Amalkar Sh- Amal Shabbat. <laughs> You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Over all of the nations from the elders. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. We're talking about Kwanzaa with Dr. Amilcar Shabazz from the Afro-Am department at UMass Amherst and Ayanna Crawford is the Kwanzaa Collective President and we just talked about the seven principles and we uh, have a day and an occasion, a place for all of these seven principles that will be celebrated in and around Western Mass. Do you want to talk about the different locations and and the celebration as it continues to expand year after year? Absolutely. And so thank you so much for that. And so we've decided probably in the last 10 years to really make a concerted effort to um, share Kwanzaa with other communities. And so on the first day of Kwanzaa, we will be in Chicopee. Uh, We've um, shared this opportunity with the Chicopee community, with the mayor's office, and they have embraced it. And so we come with our traditions of the libation statement. We come with our traditions of the lighting of the Kanara. We come with our traditions of gifts, bearing gifts of song, of dance, and to really sort of hone in on the historical aspects of Kwanzaa. And so each um, day we're going to be doing that sort of formality in terms of ceremonial piece. And the, the Uh, mayor will also be proclaiming Kwanzaa week in his city as well. And so we're super excited. So on on the first day, which is Umoja, we will be in Chicopee. 11 a.m. City Hall in Chicopee right there, the 26th of December. Yes. And then on the 27th, we will be back in our home world here in Springfield where, you know, Springfield has been such an amazing contributor to Kwanzaa in terms of making sure that it's alive, that it's uh, full of awareness for the city residents. Um, And so we'll be at City Hall with Mayor Dominic Sarno. And that day, we're going to do the same. We're going to be bringing gifts. We're going to be bringing song. We're going to be bringing dance. We're going to have Dr. Shabazz as a keynote speaker. Uh, We're going to have poets. We're going to have awards for the community. And we're really going to help people understand, again, that these principles are uh, a daily life and that you can utilize them not only during this historical time in terms of Kwanzaa, but every day. Um, we're also going to have 
um, drummers. Uh, we have the African drummers that will be coming, um, a little bit of African dancing as well. And we're going to be in sort of the African traditional garments as well. We're going to wear the geles. <laughs> we're going to wear the dashikis. We're going to wear those very brilliant, bright colors, uh, myself and Dr. Shabazz and, and the team. Um, and we'll also, you know, just be bringing that really the unity and the community uh, together on that day. And then on the third day, we will be in Holyoke, uh, Massachusetts, which we're ex super excited to be there again. This will be our fourth time uh, with the mayor, uh, uh, Joshua uh, Garcia. It actually started, I'm looking back here now, in 2019 yes. with, with Alex Morse. Yes, and exactly. Then, and then um, uh, 2021, uh, Mayor uh, Joshua Garcia mm -hmm. uh, welcomed us there. And, and this is all under the leadership of uh, Teresa Cooper Gordon, or Co Sister Coogee, as we say, doing great work there. Yeah. And that one's at 1 o'clock at the Steps City absolutely, Hall on absolutely. the Thursday, the 28th. Yes, exactly. And so, we again, we wanted to make sure that we were bringing awareness to each of the cities around Western Mass. And so we have a chairperson. And so Teresa Gordon, who is a political advocate and activist in Holyoke, we made her the chairwoman of Holyoke so that we could support her in the efforts and making sure that Kwanzaa was living and breathing and she had a support system. And so the Kwanzaa Collective not only is going to do this particular type of program, but next year, and I'm putting it on air now, <laughs> to remind the mayor of Holyoke that he wants to do a festival he made it very clear. And so we hope to bring the Festival of Kwanzaa next year to Holyoke. Nice. Yes. And so we're excited to be able to work with him. And then the next days that we have um, are going to be in the community. In the city of Springfield, we have the Artist Cafe, who's going to do an event on that Friday. Uh, we also want the community to do the virtual piece as well. So we're going to have a day where you're going to be able to access us virtually. Uh, with some pieces around um, the history of Kwanzaa, some drumming, some national events that are happening. We're going to show that to you all. Um, and then we're going to have the citywide Kwanzaa in Springfield, Massachusetts. And we want every city and town from this listening audience to come out on December 30th uh, from 1 to 530 at the Raymond Jordan Center. And we're going to have drumming, dancing, singing, speakers, awards, free food, uh, vendors, uh, black and brown vis uh, businesses. And we're going to just have a wonderful time for everyone to enjoy, no matter your race, no matter your creed, no matter your age. We want the community of Springfield to come out to learn about Kwanzaa, understand the meaning of Kwanzaa, and to be in the space where you can just hear more about the festival of Kwanzaa. And going back to the first day, I want to give a shout out to Medway, Massachusetts. Medway yes. Marches invited me up there to, uh, to, to to participate in their Kwanzaa. But on the uh, sixth day, Kuumba Creativity, uh, we really want everybody just converge on little little old Amherst. Yes. Uh, we're going to be at New Africa House on the University of Massachusetts campus uh, beginning at 1 p.m. We'll have great food. We're going to have... Uh, um, all, all of the similar kinds of cultural expressions, and they've got me talking on the creative economy and the gift of black folks. So all of these are free and open to the public. Come out and join us. That's sponsored by the Black Business Association of Amherst area. Is there uh, one place where people can find out about all these regional Kwanzaa events, Ayana? So we're on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Just Google or, or, or research uh, Black uh, Kwanzaa Collective, and you will it'll pop up. Uh, different events that we have up. So you can hashtag us, and Kwanzaa if, Collective. If you're a part of a community that doesn't yet have a celebration but wants to maybe look into doing it next year because you're kind of out of time this year, <laughs> <laughs> but for like next year planning for the future, is that where they go to to, to come, connect come with you? Absolutely, come we've out. We've got Greenfield coming down to mm. uh, to Amherst on, on the 31st. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. uh, but they're a whole uh, city. They can have smart. their own celebration. Yeah. They, and they'll launch next year. They yeah. certainly can. And yeah. we actually wanted to reach out to West Springfield too. We did have some conversations with them, but we're going to look to them for next year. But we certainly want to just have an opportunity for each city to do their proclamation, to acknowledge Kwanzaa, so then they can do their own huge event. And we would love to support them as a Kwanzaa collective, myself, Dr. Shabazz, and our wonderful team, Maria, um, Teresa, um, Radine, so many people. One day, huh? <laughs> there we go. Ayanna Crawford, the Kwanzaa collective president, and Dr. Amakar Shabazz. 
Thank you both so much. Here is a Kwanzaa. Here is Happy a- Kwanzaa.